Hi, Solomon. Sorry, uh, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Hi. Uh, welcome to the second uh, healthcare section. So this is our agenda today. The first uh, uh, session will be from Mansi about data visualization use cases in healthcare. It will be followed by an online poll. Then the second session will be taken by Dr. McClain, visualizing demographic data in Tableau. Then it will be followed by introducing as hashtag. So uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, let me introduce our first uh, speaker. Um, Mansi is an healthcare professional with experience in clinical care, healthcare consulting, market research, performance measurement, data and visual analytics. She is a certified Lean Six Sigma Green Belt and certified Scrum Master. In her current role, she designs and monitors program KPIs and evaluates performance of providers in Southeast United States. Let's welcome Mansi. Thank you, Solomon, for such a nice introduction. Let me start sharing my screen. Um, all right, are you all able to see my screen? I think you are. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to such a global group. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you really for helping me give back to this vibrant Tableau community. Um, a little bit about me. So I started my career as a clinician. I practiced for about five years, then moved into healthcare consulting. Um, currently, I'm in the healthcare analytics and IT space. So you see me doing sort of a cartwheel over there. What do I do at work? As Solomon mentioned, I design, monitor KPIs. That's our operational KPIs and our outcome KPIs. I do statistical analysis, calculate cost savings and ROI. And as I mentioned, the operational KPIs, our operational KPIs flow from Salesforce. So I'm involved in creating custom objects, fields, flows, reports, and dashboards. Um, speaking of work, I work at Alliant Health Solutions. Alliant is a quality improvement and quality innovation organization working in Southeast United, uh, South, Southern Eastern States of United States. Uh, we, help pro we help providers achieve quality of care and better outcomes. I'm a member of ATAC, that's Atlanta Apple Tableau User Group. I'm certified Six Sigma Green Belt and certified Scrum Master. And if you want to connect with me, I've given my handles over there. Disclaimers, the, the use cases that I'm about to show are from my own work. For purpose of this presentation, I've modified, de-identified and changed the context. So basically it's pretty much either publicly available data or dummy data. Icons that I've used over here are from Flat Icons or Microsoft and really a big shout out to them. They are such great creative designers and I use them frequently. Of course, my opinions are my own. So these are not endorsement and they do not reflect opinions of my employer. So let's begin. Healthcare ecosystem. The other day, Solomon and I were talking about healthcare and uh, we discussed how broad it is. You know, it's a big umbrella. And so uh, on your left, what you see is a high level overview of healthcare ecosystem with patient being in the center. And on the periphery, we have providers, payers, professional associations, quality organizations, patients, advocates, employers, and government. My company Align falls under the quality organization uh, bucket and we are funded by CMS. On your right, what you see is more granular level from IBM. And so they're sort of embracing the domains and the subdomains that contribute to healthcare. I believe Solomon is sort of doing a poll after my session just to understand, you know, where, what the group mix is like and where you all fall in. But I'm pretty sure that, you know, you'll be probably following in this umbrella and, you know, making healthcare better. From healthcare ecosystem, now let's look at healthcare data sources. So the primary source of data can be from the providers or can be from the patient. And then we have various data sources, so from drug testing, labs, uh, mobile healthcare, um, EHR data, insurance, and public health. My domain lies in insurance and public healthcare. That's what we use most often. So where to begin? Now we all will be at a different stage in our data visualization journey. You can be either a beginner or your organization can be a beginner, you know, starting on the path of data visualization and data literacy. 
in making data-driven decisions. So you could start looking at your existing reports and dashboards, your existing analysis, or our, everybody's best friend, you know, the Excel and the Word documents. And I see Bonnie smiling at me because she agrees with me. Um, and so to give you an example, so the first use case that I'm trying to show over here is, you know, take your existing reports and try to convert it into Tableau visualization and show the value that Tableau brings. This is an example of my 12 page report that I had um, that talked about the demographics. So we do diabetes self-management training for patients. So uh, there were two parts to it. There was the demographic analysis, understanding what the, demographic, uh, or the, the demographics of the patients look like, and then um, how was the patient activation? So before class and pre and post class, whether there was an increase in knowledge, skill, and attitude towards managing their care. Um, so what I've used is I've taken basic demographic data, put it up in Tableau, I've used big action numbers, and you see a bar chart that displays the split by gender, by their education, their health condition, and most of the people who attended the classes had type 2 diabetes. The second use case is, if you remember the healthcare ecosystem that I showed, uh, in any healthcare system, patient or the customer is the center or the focus of your work. So that's the voice of customer in terms of six, Lean Six Sigma. Where would you get your patient feedback? That could be from patient surveys. You could also get your feedbacks from focus groups and interviews. You can get your feedbacks from ratings and reviews. So the second use case, and I think probably you all should be using this for that, is to use it for feedbacks and surveys. Take the data that you've got from feedback and survey and put it up on Tableau and see what results it's giving you. So this is our patient feedback overview. On the top that you see, are of course these, the, the data over here has been modified, so this is not a real number, but it tells you, the big action number tells you the respondents, the response rates. I've used bar charts and run charts to display the response rate over time. On the bottom half that you see is a performance category over time. So we had five categories and under each category you have four to five questions. What I've tried to do over here is I've tried to rank them and see which categories have performed better, better over time. And so this is, to, uh, this is done by using bump chart in Tableau. And then you get to see your mean scores are of five. How much did they score for the current year? That was 2019 back then. The third use case. So we talked about the voice of customer. Let's look at voice of process. So what is my process telling me or what my data set is telling me? Now, it can be de depending on your domain, it may differ, but generally when we are looking at voice of process or your, com uh, your data set, we look at your frequencies. We look at the spread of data, the mean, median, mode. Uh, if you have a longitudinal data set, then we look at the time series. We look at your rankings, so your top end, bottom end, your ratios, proportions, your deviation. So it could be deviation from your target. If you're doing predictive analysis, then that would be deviation from your expected values. You could use correlations. You could use nominal comparison. So that's basically cutting data by dimensions. And if you have geographic data, then you can look at um, the prevalence or the spread and identify the areas with most in need. So the third use case is data exploration. And I cannot emphasize how Tableau is useful in doing data exploration. Um, the, whenever I get a data set, my first thing is to put it in Tableau and see what it's telling me, you know. So if you're not using it for anything else, please use it for data exploration. So to quickly go over that, so for spread of data, I usually typically use histograms. However, my favorites are box plots. It gives me a great, um, insights into spread of data, how they're compared against each other. Where's the mean? Where's the median? So over here, the mean is 53. It's slightly above the median. So the data set would be sort of center on the left. So it would be a right tail data. And it helps me identify the outliers. If you have longitudinal data, put it up in the run chart and it will give you your longitudinal trend. I've also used Tableau to create Pareto analysis. So Pareto analysis is your 80-20 principles. So as in for many events, roughly 80% of defects come from 20% of causes. So on your y-axis, what you're seeing is our prices. 
and your x-axis are your subservice and prescription categories. And so I've lined them up and I put it up on chart. And the line that you see is the percent of total. So what you see from here is 80% of the cost come from close to 20% of the um, categories over here. So if I draw, were to draw a line over here, approximately 10 um, subcategories and service categories are costing us 80% of that bulk. So that helps, you know, that this could be used in, in your work where you're trying to understand what is contributing most to the effect. You can use Pareto analysis for that. I've used control charts. Control charts help you identify common cause versus special cause variation. So this is pretty much, so what does that mean is if, you, if your point is about three standard deviation from the mean, so this is your upper limit and your lower control limit, there is something happening which is special or different than the usual one. So I, I can write over here, see that this point is way above the three standard deviation. Um, this helps in uh, determining whether the process is working within acceptable parameter limits or not. If not, then that needs to be investigated. So, you know, these points which are close to three standard deviation, they could be investigated, used in control phase of Six Sigma projects if you're working in those projects. If you have geographic data, you can put it up, you can identify it, helps you doing your basic analysis of identifying where's the need or you could do more complicated analysis where over here I've tried to, you know, sort of do two categories. First one is I've rated by, uh, rated by ranks one, two, three, and five. And then there was another criteria that we had to meet. And so just do a combination chart of it and see um, how your uh, data set looks like and where should you target. So that's your data exploration. The fourth piece that Tableau really helps out is in doing market research and insights. And of course, this is secondary research. Your primary research is when you go and interview, but the secondary research is from the data sets that you have. It can be domain specific, but generally what we are trying to look at when we are looking at market research is trying to understand the market size, the current trends, our competitors, you know, where the customers are located, where's the need, um, who influences their purchases or are they influenced by social media when it comes to purchases? Are there substitutes? For me, uh, my market research focuses on where's the need. So that's prevalence, historical trends, current infrastructure. And what are the contributing factors? So your social determinants of health and your comorbidities. All right. So before the pandemic hit us, there was epidemic, the opioid epidemic. So I was working on an opioid project trying to identify opioid hotspots. And I used the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services data set. They do a fantastic job of uploading data, I think almost monthly. So this most current data they give. I've used that data, I plot it up and look at the, North Car and look at the map of North Carolina and identified a couple of counties that were really had a high proportion of opioid related death. Um, that made me think, how about I look into how the counties have performed over time? So looking at this, I'll start with the bottom half. So I picked up those counties and I sort of did a run chart on them to see how they've performed over time. You see almost all of them are showing a, a slightly higher trend followed by a dip, especially Mecklenburg and Guilford, if you see, they both started at 11. I believe even Wake was close to 11, it's around 10. So they all started, they went up, and then now they're showing a downward trend. For purpose of demonstration, I also used the Viz in animation chart. It's a, it's a great feature, I love it. You know, where you can uh, trace the point throughout the time. And so this is what I've done for Mecklenburg, where you know it started low and then went up, and then now it's somewhere close to 100 over here. So based on this, I thought, you know, how about we see how the state is performing? And so I look at the state trend and I see the same pattern over here. There is a sort of, you know, at, from 2013, there was an uptick, crazy uptick, and then it went down. So you could ask questions from your data. You know, what happened in 2017 that it started showing a decrease, you know? what interventions were done and can we use those interventions in other states, you know, in other places to bring about better outcomes. And then we worked on that and find out outcomes. And then uh, for purpose of presentation, I'll just stop here for, for the market research piece. 
The fifth place, right. So what happened? You know, your descriptive analytics to understand what has happened. Why did it happen? That's your diagnostic uh, analytics. And what will happen is your predictive analytics. So it's basically your stats. You're trying to understand your associations, your predictors, your forecasting. All right, so coming back to my lovely box plots. I love them. Um, so I tried to understand the cardiovascular death rates in the United States. So I took the data set and plotted up in, in Tableau. So on your y-axis, what you're seeing are death rates. And on your x-axis, what you're seeing are states. And the circles over here are the counties within the state. And the red line over here, which is about 15, 14, that's the average death rate that you're seeing. And so this helped me quickly identify a lot of counties were poor performing. You know, look at the rates of greater than 3,500 3, rates. And then, you know, I could identify, like, look at Rhode Island, you know, they were, they were all this good, you know, similar, somewhere around 1,400 below the average, national average. And if you look at Mississippi, where we were trying to understand uh, uh, what was happening, you can see, you know, most of the data points are above average. So we looked into Mississippi, plotted it on the map, same thing, identified areas where there were high death rate, and then... We all know cardiovascular death doesn't happen in isolation. There are risk factors for that. So that could be diabetes, obesity, or physical inactivity. Uh, that got me to thinking, how about I see if there is a correlation? So my question was, is there a correlation between cardiovascular deaths and diabetes? I put it up. I used a correlation matrix in, in Tableau, and I looked it up. And I see a positive trend um, over time. I mean, a positive trend between cardiovascular death and diabetes percentage. So that made me think, hmm, are there other confounding factors? You know, so is correlation between cardiovascular death and there are other variables that are there in my data sets? Um, and are there confounding factors? So on your y-axis, what you're seeing is cardiovascular death. And on your x-axis, I've taken up the other variables that I had in my data sets. So that's diabetes, obesity, physical inactivity, uh, if the patient is high, greater than 65 years old, uh, air quality, and medical eligibility. Now, when I look at this data, I see a positive correlation. You know, it's trending uh, in a positive, it has a positive slope, whereas age sort of didn't have a slope. It was a flat line. So what I did was, my hypothesis was, you know, uh, diabetes and cardiovascular um, deaths are correlated. I started adding all the variables into it. And of course, this was done in SAS. So I tried to identify confounding factors. I compared the BX, that's diabetes percentage, and I added other variables to that and created a multiple regression. If the regression coefficient of diabetes sort of changed by 10%, then I considered that variable as a, co as a confounder. So using that, I got this result. So, uh, so your multiple regression equation is your y predicted is beta naught plus beta one into x one plus beta two into x. And then if you have multiple variables, you can keep going on. Uh, when I ran this analysis in SAS, my model was statistically significant. My R square was 0 0.42, not bad. And so what we can see from this is, sorry about that, is that Cardiovascular death rate per 100,000 predicted would be 614. That's your slope, your intercept. You can't do anything about it. Um, and then 31.62 into diabetes percentage. What does that mean is a unit increase in diabetes percentage over here is associated with 31.62 unit increase in cardiovascular death per 100,000 holding physical inactivity as constant. So. The second half of analysis was done in SAS, but Tableau really helped me understand which variables I should pick and put it into my model. And speaking of future, uh, forecasting. Now here, everything is done in Tableau. You don't have to use another software for that. So I tried to understand um, deaths related to diabetes over time, and I used Tableau's forecast function. Tableau does a good job of describing the model. So if you see over here, the model quality was okay. That's fair enough. And my MSAE uh, was about 0 0.44, so not bad either. And so to summarize what we've looked into, we've been quick. 
uh, where to start. Start with your existing reports and analysis. Try to see your voice of customer. Find, get that data set, plot it in, and see what your insights you're getting. That's a big thing. You should be really focusing on that. Voice of your process. Take your data sets and put and explore your data. You can use it for your market research. And of course, you can use it for your descriptive diagnostic and predictive analysis. As you move through your journey, you feel more comfortable. You can start using it for that. And I think that's about it. You can connect with me using my uh, handles. And Solomon, again, thank you so much for inviting me. And I really appreciate you starting a group that's focused on healthcare. So big thank you to you. And I'll stop sharing. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mansi, for this wonderful session. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, I see. It's Bonnie's County. I, I, I feel you. Well, I actually gave a very long uh, Tableau user group. Uh, meeting in Raleigh for their tug. Mm -hmm. uh, I lead the tug in Greensboro and we talked all about the opioid crisis and looking at it globally and looking at the impact it had on our communities. So I was very excited to see uh, your data and you um, having a conversation about it that's not just, you know, that, that's asking questions. You know, a lot of times people forget about the story. They do the analytics and then they put it up on a shelf and then no one tells the narrative and that's yeah. the point. If you're not going to talk about it and gather new insights. Mm -hmm. you know. And that's, that's, that you bring up a really good point because I have seen a lot of people put up present data and create complex things, but they really forget about the basic things about what are you trying to answer from this, you know, or what is your question looks like? How is, how is this going to help me creating beautiful path analysis? Yeah. Okay, but then how is it? Because my, my, I have a clinical base, you know, my user is a clinical person. They really need to know what does this mean and how can I help the providers do better? How can I improve the community? So Absolutely. I, I get it. And North Carolina has done a really great job about managing opioid crisis. There's so many interventions when we studied the whole thing. Um, well, we're killing everybody with COVID right now. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a hot mess. But, you know, it's when you work in your community, um, it, you can actually go get data pretty readily because they want help. They need people to look at the data. And I right. like what you were saying because it's perfect segue when you were talking about the question and the narrative. And, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of rolled back my presentation to kind of like level set everybody with, you know, it's great that we're all experts in data and analysis, but, you know, we have to kind of go back upstream a little bit before we, you know, bring powerful analytics uh, to the public. Yeah, I, you are absolutely right. Solomon, do we have any questions? Yeah. Uh, right. I think we can take the questions to the last. Okay. Uh, let, yeah, let's move on to the next session. Uh, I think even the poll, we can keep it to the last. We'll go to the directly to the second session. And uh, Dr. McLean. So Dr. McLean is a member of uh, National Press Club. 500 women scientists, investigation reporters, and editors, Association of Healthcare Journalists, and past member of the National Association of Science Writers, allowing access to a wide variety of health policy and health economic discussions. She is also a tab user group leader and data analytics professional working to improve data literacy through education. Let's welcome Dr. McLean. Now, I hope you can see what, do you, you see the slide? <laughs> I hope. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I always I like to start with a slide to remember to remind us what we're doing. Right. We're looking, seeing, and then we're coming up with uh, observations. We're coming up with narratives, and sometimes, you know, we get lost in the purpose of what we see. And and this applies to us as a user of data and a creator of data. And that's why I find it very relevant to quite often go upstream and continue the, you know, start the conversation. So unfamiliar visual data. Okay, hold on, I gotta, I'm looking to advance the screen and it won't let me. There it goes. 
So um, a lot of us are, are coming to data from all different um, levels, different perspectives, and Mansi mentioned this as well. It's important to know, a lot of people are like, why me? I can't possibly do this. How can I participate? I don't have this degree or that degree. And I like to share, you know, my, briefly, my coming of age story where I started in exercise physiology, uh, got a doctorate in chiropractic, did clinical care around musculoskeletal, went to Wake Forest to become a physician, uh, pivoted back out to, didn't finish that part, pivoted back into UNC in, my, in Greensboro and studied population genetics, started a consultancy, and then realized that the data was driving all the discussions. And when you work as a consultant, often, you know, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, you're told what to write, what to think, and what to process. I wasn't comfortable with that. So I went to an online executive education program at Columbia and learned applied data analytics. And that may be a little extreme for me. Most of you, if that's not your area, but oh my God, baptism by fire. Uh, you know, we did huge, you know, publicly available data sets and Python. Um, and it was a nest of snakes, I tell you. But uh, coming out this end, it gave me more tools to put in my toolbox. So what I do more now in Datamonger, um, that's the handle over on Twitter. I do a lot of workshops, a lot of uh, discussions. Um, a lot of training, a lot of writing. I'm a digital media specialist over at Data and Donuts. I write about healthcare, and I always forget to remind everybody this. I run the Tableau Healthcare Sub Analytic Group over on LinkedIn. So if you want to come over there, just find us on LinkedIn, and, and we'll gladly accept you. Um, I do a lot of consultancy across the stack, um, and. So let, let's just get started here. Um, in fact, I'm speaking at SciPy, which is uh, Python, their conference, um, I believe in July. We're doing everything virtual. And the topic there, we're going to be looking at diversity. So if that's an area of interest, reach out and I'll um, either share my presentation with you or see you know, about having you attend. Now, what I like about this slide, this came obviously from physics, but I think it applies to data science very well because we have classical data analytics. We have a lot of people that, you know, hey, it's statistics or bust. And if you're a data scientist, then you're not a data analyst. And computer scientists rule. And we get caught up in all of the, the classical nature of it. But what I like about this is how it brings everything together. So I think about the classical data analytics, kind of maybe pre-Tableau, if any of us can think back that far. I think I've been to six or seven conferences, so it seems like we've all been doing this forever. But if you go back to any of the legacy um, tableau, you, you're quite surprised with how rudimentary it looks in comparison. Um, and then I like the relativity because I work a lot in intersectionality and relative reminds me of that, where when I'm looking at data across demographics, you know, when I walk in a room, you know, I'm not just a brown person. I'm not just a woman. You know, you're all of these things at one time, right? You can be an analyst, you can be, you know, a minority, you could be a woman, your gender. I mean, these are all things. We have to remember that we are informed by the unique space of our own story. And we do project that on the stories that we tell. And I like the quantum physics side of it because it reminds me of granularity to always go down to the appropriate level of data. Um, and who could ignore the chasm of ignorance? I think we all sit in there <laughs> a, few, a few hours each week and we, you know, we hope to do better and we look to the future. And we also have philosophy. There's a lot of ideology around data analysis that informs all of us on, do we do things this way? Do we do Tableau? Okay, Are we on Can, can you make it to full screen? Actually, it's showing your presentation. Sorry. Oh, we're just finding that out now yeah. that we're not on full screen? Yeah, you're not on a full screen. OK. Um, Oh, hold on. Yeah, perfect. Oh, see, that's the opposite for me. Now, now I'm not. It's fine. Okay. So, um, and then we look to the future. So basically, that you know, everything I said still applies there. Apologize for not for not being full screen. And just really quickly, you know, when I this first part is the part that just really resonated with me, and it came from the graphic we just saw. You know, you have to think about a mind map. You have to think about all of the things informing you. At least I do. I mean, I, if you have different tools, you know, there's Excel, 
And uh, it was sweet of Nancy to think I was smiling. I, I may have been grimacing a little bit because I get so many clients that are like, well, make it look like a spreadsheet. I don't want to scare the CEO. You know, they want to see a stack bar chart. And I'm like, well, that's not the best way to view the data. But um, it, this is really interesting. And you'll see a little bit more of this when you get the slides. Now, what I usually do here is I ask people what they see. And the point of this is to show you how our, what we expect to see kind of obscures what we can see. And the important part of this is, see, I use art to teach a lot of people how to be data literate because you're much more comfortable looking at something like this and saying, I have no idea, what is that? Then if I put up like a really nice time series and, or a scatter plot or God forbid a Sankey diagram and you're looking, you're like, well, I should be saying something smart here. I should understand this. But when we look at art, we're like, well, who the heck gets that anyway? And, and we, we become more vulnerable and we start sharpening skills that we didn't know we didn't have. The most important thing about this image, which I'm going to reveal to you in a, in a minute, is that once you see what it is, you cannot unsee it. You will never look at it again a different way. That's also to remind us about all of the charts and graphics that we're exposed to, right? The New York Times, Financial Times, especially during COVID, if you're not as active as we are, if we work in the space, you've probably have seen more graphics than you've seen in your entire professional life in the last three months. So the reveal here is this, this is the Dallenbach cow. And the reason he's so important is because this was used to teach aerial fighter pilots how to look at landscapes. And they began with something as simple. Now, when I go back, it's a big old cow, right? You can't unsee that, it's obvious. And you're probably thinking, well, how the heck did I miss that, right? So we're gonna move now. And another thing, you know, this is Karnofsky. And what I like about these slides, and I'm gonna fly through these, usually in a workshop where we're learning how to do this, we take more time but I only have a little bit of time with you and I want you to get a lot of different flavors of what it's like to work in data viz. So these Karnofskys are very interesting because they put on filters. Some, he builds filters into his work and we, build, we put filters in there too, whether it's a bias or whatever you wanna call it, our cognition biases, we have filters. So when we look here, if you look real quickly, you can see the big, you know, the big animals, right? Well, if you look again, now more things are revealed. This is a different filter. Maybe it's a different bias, a different experience, a different data set. Maybe you have a different directive from a higher up that wants to see a certain thing. And you can see, depending on your filter, different things are revealed. And this may be like a dramatic way to inform you, but it's also important to ask yourself, what is your filter? And before I shoot over to my Tableau slides, I'd like to share my buddy here, uh, this is John Winthrop's wife. You probably were hoping to see her today. No. <laughs> the important thing about her and in healthcare, we they use uh, Yale uses art to help train their medical students, and I work exclusively in healthcare, so I found this very useful. And normally, if we were together and able to interact and speak, I would ask you to describe what you see. So what I'm going to do is be a spoiler alert and tell you what you know dozens and dozens possibly hundreds at this point have revealed. So what they tend to notice is the blue, you know, sometimes they talk about the fabric of the gown. They talk about the chair. She's holding nectarines. She's got a jaunty little bonnet on the top. It's got the little red and white curls. And, you know, and if we think we're really observant, we're going to say, wow, look at the necklace and look at the bow. And let me tell you what we don't hear. And I don't know if I've ever heard it. Nobody talks about the mahogany table. And if you look at the mahogany table, it is quite elaborate. There's a beautiful reflection. You can see the painting exquisitely mirrored back towards you. Now, in a, in a beautiful picture of the portrait of, you know, John Winthrop's wife, is that really important? Big deal, I miss the mahogany table. What happens if you're working in medicine and there's a pre-existing condition or there's a lab finding that's particularly critical and relevant to the diagnosis? If that's your mahogany table, there are consequences. So we always use this language when we're looking at data together is that was a mahogany table. So we need to think about how we mitigate our biases. And I also work as, as Solomon mentioned, I'm a member of the National Press Club and I decided to work independently because when I was asked to go cover 
medical conferences, they would always tell me, what are you going to write about? I want you to write about this. I want you to write about that. And my response was, you know, if you send me into a conference and, you know, maybe 15,000 to 45,000 attendees and you tell me, or it's the same thing as sending me out on a busy street in New York and telling me, I want you to only talk about the blue mailboxes that you see out on the street. Well, if that's my assignment, I'm so busy looking for obscure blue mailboxes that I might miss something very pertinent and relevant to the conference, to the findings, or to the proceedings. So I refuse to write on assignment. I go and I see what's revealed. And a good, a good like art example of that is Ellis Lowry, because he always, he likes to bury these little lampposts in all his, his pictures. And if I hadn't told you about the lamppost, you might look at the striking man and the figure, which is him. Uh, you might look at, you know, the factory or so, there may be something else you notice. But once I share with you his pictures, what are the, the first thing you notice is these lampposts. They're like everywhere. He's actually more famous for his matchstick men, which if you look deeper into the photograph, uh, the picture, the art, you can see the matchstick man. But, you know, even in this busy photograph, where I, the, I keep calling it a photograph, the pictures, the artwork, you look at the people, but now that I've primed you to look for lampposts, you see it right in the middle of the picture. So, you know, it might make you think about things can be distracting in graphics and visualizations, and we need to determine what's relevant to the story. And this uh, Las Maninas is a very famous painting. Um, and what's important here is I like to use this to tell people, like if you were gonna title this, what would you title it? And you know, we get so many different titles for this because nobody knows what the heck is going on. But what is actually going on is it's called Ladies in Waiting. So basically the point of the story is everyone's attending to the little girl at the middle but where's that guy going at the back of the picture, leaving the frame, going up the stairs? This guy on the far left is actually the, the uh, painter, depicted in his own painting, like a self-portrait. Um, they have, you know, there's a dog here, there's the children. Um, and then you see, if you look in the middle of the picture, there's a, a picture being reflected back at you. So somebody else is looking. You are from the perspective of whoever the couple is. And why is there a nun here? Like, what's going on? This is not that far off from what we're confronted with often when we're looking at d data visualizations and we're giving graphics to look at. And I was actually brought in to kind of clarify a lot of the air around the COVID-19 uh, crisis about the, the data that was distracting people. And I used this photograph to kind of calm everyone down <laughs> and get them to pay attention. And this really quickly, I, I, we kind of covered all this, but what's really interesting here once I show them Mrs. Winthrop, they're like, I'm going to just nail it. And they come in here and they'll say, oh, look, there's some earrings and people start looking. But what people often miss is underneath the lady's arm, the lady in waiting's arm with the paper, you can actually see windows reflected into that bowl. And these are just little, little things to prime you into looking. And, a, you know, I had this with a, um, I guess it was a graduate school, a local graduate school in the business school and everyone was like oh he's been partying too hard look at him he's just he came home he just passed out and then the medical people in the crowd noticed the pallor right the, if i show this to a physician audience they're like oh i'm looking at a dead man definitely and so when i lighten it up a little bit what you can see is there's a vial in his hand he's actually poisoned himself because he was um he was just found out for plagiarizing all these poems he had become famous for. So, you know, when we look deeper into pictures and don't project ourselves, we might become more enlightened and see more of what uh, we're supposed to see. So, you know, I always leave this for people. When you look at an image, you want to know, was anything left out? Is there anything else that you want to know about that graphic, that information presented to you? Um, write down specifically what you see. If you cover up part of an image, would you describe something differently? Is there something there that you're missing? Look for something unique every time you see something. And, you know, basically I summarize it really quickly and what do I know, what don't I know? And the most important thing is what data would I want to bring in 
to clarify what it is I don't know. And a lot of what I do is based on my childhood friend, Amy Herman. They're actually doing a story. Uh, they've bought the rights to this book to make a movie because she works for SEAL Team 6 and, you know, all across the military, New York, you know, NYPD. Um, in fact, some of the clients she works with, they're not allowed to be even seen at the Met together. They can't be seen at the Metropolitan Museum of Art together. So she has to do a lot of this in bunkers. And it's based on a little bit of what we were talking about today. So if that area interests you as we move on to the tableau specific part of the talk, I always recommend, I don't get anything for this. I just share the book because a lot of people aren't aware um, that such a thing exists. So now I'm gonna switch to tableau. I have to do it the old school way because they couldn't train me up to do it right. Can you see the screen? I'm thinking no, because I can't hear anybody. No, not, not it. Okay, hold on, hold on. I'll get it, I'll get it. All right, I got to swap. It worked before. Let me try again. We'll do it the old-fashioned way. All right, let me know if it pops up the way it's supposed to. Yeah. You what is my data question? Yeah. Okay, good. So it should be full screen. And the reason why I'm starting here is because my perspective may be a little different because I work uh, primarily as a consultant and I can be brought in to, you know, name the pharmaceutical company, name the uh, help, the provider, the payer, and they'll sit you down and they just want you to go to town. You know, we brought you in, let's go. Here's my stuff. And I'm like, well, what, what's your question? And everybody stops. They have not formulated a data question. They just want to bring you in and have you make all these great charts. So uh, as you know, that's really not the objective. <laughs> so you have to learn how to create the data question, find data that could potentially answer the question. And then often, if you don't have access to the data or the data doesn't exist, then you have to reformulate the question. So then you have to figure out where is this data? And that's what we're just gonna do a little bit here uh, because it's a little example of how I work. And when I was invited to speak with you, I was curious. I, I was like, well, I wanna know if there's any data specific to India that I can find because all we usually see is, you know, US data. And I, so I, was, I became a little curious. And, you know, what I wanted to avoid is finding data that, and this is the biggest problem I think with Tableau is that we get huge data sets and then we just start looking for pretty patterns and things and we cherry pick these clusters to suit an argument. And that's called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. So what you're looking at here is, you know, the king just randomly shoots arrows everywhere. And this guy is like many of us. <laughs> In consultancy we're just going to paint a little target around there and say well done you look what you did you know and that's often a little premature so what I'm going to do is just share a few data resources with you uh, to help you maybe not have to go in and use um, your dusty old spreadsheets or to invite you to get a little more data curious because one thing I don't like working with is dummy data because I feel like my data when it shows up is just ugly, gnarly, and needs to have a lot of work done on it. So why don't I share that with you? So if you're not familiar with IPUMS, you can see here that there's a lot of data. There's health surveys here, there's global health, there's you know, the US census data, international data. Now the reason why I couldn't use the global health data to share with you is because I would have to sign away one of my children as collateral they don't like their data being sold or, or being shared outside of an academic research environment. But you can come to IPUMS over here and you can look and see and create custom data sets about you know, social, economic, health research. And what's really interesting, if you go into um, the census data, is you will be able to um, Let's load. You'll be you'll actually be able to um, look at this the COVID data if you're interested in that thing. They they've put out surveys every month 
or maybe even every week, I don't know if they've, uh, of the uh, surveying populations impacted by COVID. And I forget what it's called off the top of my head for some reason, uh, but you get household level data about, you know, asking people about, you know, uh, food security, asking them about their employment situation. You don't have to wait to get the monthly reports from the government. These are specific to households and families in regions you may be interested in. And if you have an interest in these population surveys, let me know and I can just kind of share some links with you afterwards. Um, so when I was looking for data that I thought might be interesting to explore, um, I found uh, Kaggle, Kaggle um, contests. You may not have thought of this as a good resource for finding data, but they have a lot of data that they put up and then they invite people to compete and do analyses. And what's really great about it is you can find the data and usually it's cleaned up a bit. You have to know a little bit about, you know, doing that sort of thing, but you can look in here. They set it up for you pretty well. And I'm just gonna show you some quick visualizations I did like within maybe 15 minutes on this type of data that you can find. And if you go over here, you can find different data, you can see discussions, you can see you can compete in some of the competitions. But I really like this resource because a lot of the questions, especially if you had to do something around something timely like COVID or opioid, somebody has pulled in that large data set and done some cleaning on it. And so now you can kind of um, find it pretty readily. And I didn't focus much on Tableau Prep because it's not the point of what we're talking about, but it is a powerful tool when you're working with large data sets you can do quick cleaning data. And the reason I share it, if you have access to it, is because anything you can do before you get into Tableau will make everything more efficient. And it, it'll take the, um, the hard work of joining tables and fixing things that you might want to change. It'll take it upstream to actually pulling it into Tableau. So just for example, like in here, maybe what I would have done is I changed some of the numerical to um, categorical. If I'm not going to add it, subtract it, or do any math with it, I'd like to see it as a string. It's easier for me to visualize. Things like that. And you, all you have to do when you pull your data in, and this is just the raw data uh, pulled in from that Kaggle set, is you know just tell them, is there a uh, header? And then you just have to kind of help coax it a little bit to get it into a form that you can work with. Um, another resource. I hope this is going to load. I don't know if it's going to load or not. But another resource is ArcGIS, which you may not think of when you're trying to find data. But what you can do if you have access to ArcGIS is you can go in, create some of the mapping, and then you, you can output some of this data. And look how valuable this data is. If you want to go into a state area, right off the bat, you can find out some high level information and you can also customize this. But you know, depending on the region that you wanna look in, you can get data that you can use and then you could export it out. So what I did is I um, exported, well, no, what I did is I connected, you know, your data, your Tableau data connections that you can do, you can connect directly to the, Arc, the Esri ArcGIS server. So all I had to do is post that map in ArcGIS, connect with it on server into my Tableau desktop, and all the data is right here. It didn't look like this, obviously, when it came out. But, you know, I just wanted to kind of show you a little bit about some healthcare information. I don't know how many of us are actually, you know, working within India, looking at the data there, or we're... You, so I just wanted to use this as a representative example because I thought it was just really powerful and interesting. So what I did here, because I work a lot in health literacy, and, you know, the question that I had, because it always starts with a data question, is, you know, we have compulsive knowledge of HIV AIDS, but let's take a variable, a subset of that knowledge and see how it tracks. So which women they may have knowledge of HIV AIDS, but do they know that they can protect themselves by using condoms? I mean, I felt like that was a really interesting question to ask. And you can see, you might want to know more about these people. You can create a more like juicy um, 
story here in the the tag but I just thought this was super interesting because I did women here and then we did it by men and you can see patterns definitely you can see patterns along like what populations may or may not be disseminating the information equally and also here if you wanted to look at a particular area you could just click it and you'll see where it is on the other chart so I mean this wasn't something I made like super professionally it was just something that I wanted to share just to show you how easy it is to get granular on data that you might not even know you had access to and this is another one I don't usually cram this much stuff on things but I just thought it was really interesting because I, I was originally going to talk more about cluster analysis because I came to it late in life, <laughs> like I was maybe last week years old <laughs> before I started using it in a compelling way on my large data sets. But all it's telling you is this, that these types of numbers have more in common with each other than they do with the other you know, data points in the data set. So you can start looking at the clusters and trying to ask different questions, like where are these people? Where are they from? You know, what's, what can I learn and where can I dig a little deeper? And I think I set this up just so we could look real quick. Yeah. So now you can look and you can look up at the top too. I don't know if you can see that really well, but we're also looking at contraceptive use by modern family planning because, you know, we want to look, we want to look at death rates, mortality rates, birth rates, you know, and we can also look at the same time we're looking at that. We can look at the percentage of the population using contraceptive and able to plan families. We can look at neonatal rates and we can just set things up like this around our questions in a visual way that's more compelling than just sharing a spreadsheet. So, you know, I wanted to end a little bit about where we started, kind of with the art side, where we think we're observing and we think of perception, but they're not really the same thing. You know, if we're trying to be perceptive in our data, we need to use all of our senses, right? We need to be looking and we need to be curious and we need to look and see what's there, what's, what might be missing. And we also should be aware of our inferences. Where are we inserting our opinion versus grounding it in data? Uh, where can we find the data? How can we articulate these observations using data that we can confirm? Maybe we can't confirm it visually, but maybe we can have, you know, a spreadsheet. Maybe we can have other information available where people can dig a little deeper and we can use a blend of some of these things. So um, that's, that's all I have for you. I wanted to leave time for us to have, you know, some questions if any have developed. Um, I stopped calling myself a data analyst probably last year because I feel like when I speak publicly to large conferences, whether they're journalists, healthcare providers, or executives, people get really intimidated and they don't realize that we're all doing the same thing. You know, we start with a data question. We ask ourselves, we try, you know, I don't believe that I know the answer, but I believe that collaboratively and collectively, if we have these conversations, we can actually um, get a little closer to having a narrative that can influence change. So Solomon, you are, I guess I'll stop my share here. Uh, thank, thank you, Doctor. It was an interesting session. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, uh, right now, we don't have any open questions. There are comments, nice sessions. Well, maybe we can ask a question to them. I, I'm really interested mm -hmm. to see like how the attendees are actually using tableau now i mean is there uh you don't have the little raise hand little oh we don't have the little yeah. raise hand guy no i think the attendees can raise their hand or they can type in the chat yeah maybe, they can type. maybe we have a shy group <laughs> i mean i it just, do people use census data with any regularity or, you know um, if anyone has a question about the types of data they're trying to locate, um, I can, I, I don't have it available, but I did a, like, I think it was a two hour workshop. It's in, 
YouTube. I can share the link uh, with you, Solomon, and you can share if anyone's interested yeah, sure. of how to find healthcare data, like where all this data is, if they're curious to try to find more of it. You, you have consolidated for India too, or is it world data? Well, I, that's why I included like how I got to um, India survey data was okay. through the channels that I shared here through the mm -hmm. census portal, through Kaggle. Um, that was the easiest place for me to find free, non-proprietary. And there's huge data sets in there, especially in the uh, ArcGIS Living Atlas. There's questions about, you know, infant mortality, diabetes, you know, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, all of the topics that Nancy was talking about as well. Um, so you know what I'm going to do? I'll share it. You guys, here's your, here's what you have to do to get the goods. <laughs> Come over to uh, the, the Tableau healthcare subgroup on LinkedIn. Okay. And what I'll do, um, are you over there, Solomon? Yeah, yeah. Because you can share a link to this there, and then I'll share some resources as a follow-up to what we talked about um, sure, today. Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next session. Uh, to know more about our uh, audience, let, let's have a little poll. So the participants has to participate in this poll so that we can know more about you and we can and give the uh, correct sessions. I mean, from from next uh, sessions onwards, we can find the right uh, topics. I'll share my screen. So. Audience, if you have smartphones, you can scan this QR or I'll share this link in the chat. One second. Where is it? Yeah. 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 Please, uh, please click the link and do what your, what the three questions. And we will see the live poll here. Can all see my screen? Yes, we do. Yeah. Can you see the uh, direct poll? Yes, we can. Yeah. So we will move on to the next question. So this is this is our uh, uh, attendees profile. So the next question will be, where do they work? Uh, 
I think we should look on to what are the others. They can type in the chat. Right. So we, yeah, we that would be really more. interesting to see the other piece. You know, where do you fall in the ecosystem? Yeah. So we have startups, medical device manufacturers, most and the others, academic and research government. So we will move on to the next question. So what is their actual background? Are they only on healthcare field or are they from computer field? So we have we have a mix of all. Yeah. So that's it. This is, these are the three questions. So we will take this into account for our next uh, events. Uh, thank you, thank you for uh, thank you for uh, participating in this session. So the next will be we like to uh, introduce uh, three hashtags. The one is if you're uh, if you're going to use Tableau uh, and and you are sharing health health visualizations, please use these three hashtags. The one is first the uh, IAD this this is our user group uh, hashtag. Then we have a common health data with this is universally used uh, hashtag. Then there is also a uh, project health with hashtag where you will find an uh, monthly uh, assignments like monthly computation so we can you can participate in those competition using this hashtag also if you search in twitter you will find the this month question so if anyone of you like to be our next speaker you can mail me at uh, uh, t solomon dot it at the rate gmail dot com so if and also we have a community group that is India Healthcare User Group. So uh, we would love to join here. So you can scan the QR code to join in our group. Or you can just search India Healthcare User Group on the Google to join our group. I think this, this is our end of the session. Uh, if if the pa participants want to talk, uh, if anybody want to talk, you can raise your hand. So. We, this is your interactive session. If anybody is interested to share anything, we can allow you to talk. I think I didn't get any answers. Okay, then let's uh, uh, finish this event. Uh, thank you each and everyone for joining this session. Thank you.